thank you for your really wonderful introductions. Uh, definitely makes us feel good here today. And without further ado, we'll get started. So like we said, like, uh, like the introduction said, we are talking about electrification and energy recovery in student residences, specifically with commercial kitchens. So again, my name is Melissa Light. This beside me is uh, David McCarricker. Hello. And we'll dive right in. So before we get started, we did just want to introduce, so we work at MCW Consultants. There are a few other divisions in our company. What we work on is, you know, constructing local buildings. We also have a division that talks about custom energy solutions, um, as well as power. And uh, we're, we're mainly focused on Canada. So what we're going to talk about today, first, we'll start off with the context and key challenges in this presentation. Uh, then we're going to talk about a reduced kitchen ventilation load, move on to domestic hot water load reduction, talk about how we tie in the laundry room, and then we'll sign off with some conclusions and key lessons. So to start off, context and key challenges. So just a little background on the building that we're using as our case study here today. Um, it is a nine floor student residence. In the basement, we have a laundry room and some staff areas. On the first level, we have a kitchen, servery, offices, some public areas. Uh, and then level two has some communal spaces and some residential areas. And then three to nine is purely residential. So that's a total of 744 beds for the University of Toronto Scarborough campus. So like we said, it's a student residence, which means that, you know, levels two to nine are gonna be mainly residential. And then on that first floor, we have a commercial kitchen and a dining hall. So the University of Toronto really was looking towards future-proofing this building. So something they really cared about was, you know, from a legislation perspective, we're, you know, working towards zero, uh, you know, net zero carbon buildings. Uh, and in Canada, we have a carbon tax that's gonna get, uh, you know, stronger as the years go on. So that's something from the legislation side that's extremely important to the University of Toronto. Uh, and then from a, you know, their greater sustainability goals, they're really looking towards mitigating their impact on climate change. Uh, and also future resiliency as the climate gets worse. Uh, you know, we have to make sure that we, you know, if we're building a building today, it's gonna to be resilient for those future changes. So in our specific typology, there are some key challenges that come along with that uh, and in general in achieving passive house certification. So one of those is a commercial kitchen, like was mentioned, is extremely difficult to, uh, you know, work into a passive house design. Um, there's just a really high energy consumption and, you know, it's, it's just a difficult design to, to integrate in, but as we'll talk about later, we, we made it work. Uh, and then also from a lower operational carbon perspective. So this is an all electric building, which includes the kitchen, which can get difficult, uh, as well as the residential domestic hot water load. So before we move forward, I just wanted to you know, acknowledge our partners on this project. So we were working with Palmer Lowe, general contractor out of Quebec. Um, IBI is the architect, EXP is the structural engineer, RDH is the passive house consultant, and we are the mechanical and electrical engineers. Today, we're only gonna focus on mechanical. So that's what David and I do. Uh, but if you have any questions, you know, outside of this presentation for any of those other fields, you know, feel free to reach out. We're all interested in moving passive house forward. So like we said, one of the main challenges in this building is that commercial kitchen. So why is it so difficult to integrate? So first of all, there's the equipment energy demand. We're not gonna talk about that too much in today's presentation, but that was something that was looked at very deeply by our team, uh, you know, our, our greater team, and you know, looking at every single piece of kitchen equipment, how can we really reduce that, that energy consumption? Moving forward, generally in a kitchen, you're creating a lot of dirty, greasy air, so that needs to be exhausted. Usually that exhaust requirement is quite high, uh, and that leads to also, you know, a high makeup airflow to balance that exhaust. And if you're bringing in makeup air from outside, if it's like in Toronto, quite cold in the winter, or it's quite hot in the summer, then you need to condition that air before it comes inside so that, you know, a user standing in the room isn't having minus uh, 20 degree Celsius, apologies for the Americans, 
uh, air dumped straight on them. So that ends up making up about 40% of the kitchen energy demand. So that's clearly an area to focus on. So what we're going to talk about today is just the ventilation portion of this. That's because we're, you know, on the mechanical side, but again, everything was looked at uh, in this, in this overall design. So the other challenge that we wanted to talk about today is from the domestic hot water load. So in a student residence, you have a lot of showers um, and a lot of, you know, suites kind of crammed into a smaller space compared to maybe a, a new build condo. So the suite showers take up 11,900 liters per day. Uh, again, okay, apologies to the Americans uh, in other units, but just for reference, you know, the kitchen is taking up about 7,000 liters per day, the laundry room only 360 liters per day, and the other fixtures in the suites or sinks here and there, uh, that accounts for about 6,400 liters per day. So clearly this is an area that needs to be addressed because generating the, you know, taking that cold water to hot water to provide hot water to the suites takes up a lot of energy. So what are some ways that we can reduce that energy consumption? One way is where possible to provide cold water instead of hot. Uh, that's not really what we're focusing on today, but that is uh, you know, the first step before you move forward. Um, the next would be recovery. So how can we heat up that water using waste heat from other areas of the building instead of uh, you know, fresh, uh, fresh power? Uh, and also how can we electrify our source? So moving forward, first, we're going to talk about the kitchen ventilation heating recovery. So there's a few different steps that you can take to improve your kitchen efficiency uh, when it comes to heat recovery and when it comes to, you know, the, the airflow you need to, to work in the kitchen. Um, the first step, just to give a little background, would be to improve the kitchen layout and equipment to minimize the exhaust required. So that's not really from the mechanical perspective, but that's the first step that you would need to take. The second step you would take would be demand controlled ventilation. So again, not getting into that too much today, but that would be modulating how much air is provided based on what's actually happening in the space at a given time. The third, which again, was prior to this presentation or, or prior to our, our stage in the process uh, would be unconditioned air to the exhaust hoods. So again, what I really wanna clarify here is that what we're talking about today is heat recovery. So we heat recovery is the last step after you've minimized your airflow from three other steps. Heat recovery is really the last step. Now that we have the minimum amount of airflow possible that we need to get to the space and the minimum amount of conditioning that we need to provide to that air, um, how do we provide that conditioning in the you know least energy intensive way possible? So without further ado, I'm gonna hand it off to Dave, who's gonna talk about how we did that. Hi everyone, uh, David McCarricker here. Uh, and I am a partner here at MCW as uh, the intro uh, said. Uh, anyway, thanks, Melissa. Um, I'm gonna walk you through the steps uh, of, of um, our approach to uh, the energy recovery uh, systems in the building. Um, one thing that, um, I want to give you a bit more background on in terms of the project. Uh, this was a competition, a design build competition, um, where not only the best, um, the best design one, but it was also a least cost as well. So some of the drivers behind some of this was also looking at minimizing or, or, or taking an approach that would, would bring our costs down so that we would look a lot more attractive in terms of uh, the, the other three competitors on the on the project, uh, and it turns out that you know we we our, our design uh, managed to reduce our costs uh, our construction costs considerably to the point where we won. Um, we weren't necessarily uh, strictly compliant with what the U of T presented, but we certainly managed to meet the passive house criteria at a much reduced cost than the other teams. So with that, um, one of the things that they did have in their illustrative design uh, that we sort of took and, and changed was this use of this heat recovery device, which uh, is this heating coil or, 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 or heat recovery coil in the kitchen exhaust airstream. Uh, and with a glycol runaround uh, circuit would transfer that heat to the incoming um, uh, airstream, the makeup airstream to, 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 
to uh, to temper the air that way. Um, and what we um, what we realized that there was some real penalties associated with that. First of all, um, that there was just this, it, it was a seasonal recovery only. Um, this thing really only recovered heat in the winter time. Uh, and it um, didn't really do much uh, in the way in the summertime. The second thing in the, the more significant of those of these things was the fan energy that was taken uh, for the kitchen exhaust and the makeup air fan uh, to have to overcome the pressure associated with these coils in the air streams. And, and th that uh, fan energy penalty is there year round. Uh, whenever the kitchen was in operation, those fan systems would be seeing that resistance, whether we were covering energy from them or not. Um, the second uh, thing, um, or the third thing, uh, was that uh, as much as you want to put filters on this, these things are still grease traps. Uh, they grease does get through uh, the, the filters and the systems, uh, and it does end up uh, gunking up the coils and it reduces the heat transfer, uh, and uh, in fact also increases the fan energy as the, as the grease builds up. And those systems still require a supplementary heat source to to temper that air. So we took a much different approach to this um, uh, with this passive heat recovery system. And we started playing with this idea uh, uh, about what would happen if we took that kitchen exhaust duct and we ran it through the center of our outdoor air intake plenum. And just that 50, 60 feet of kitchen exhaust duct, if we wrap that duct with our outdoor air, we potentially could um, temper that air uh, in the in the winter time, so that we don't have this coil that's that that or this continuous operation uh, and grease filter in our system. There's no electricity required. The static uh, penalties are much reduced compared to a coil, and there is no contact between the exhaust air and the makeup air. So we have welded steel ductwork. We have uh, uh, insulated. Uh, outdoor air uh, plenum that, that wraps around this. And um, what we found is that this helped reduce our fan energy and it helped reduce um, uh, the, the, the amount of tempering we had to do of that, that air in, in the winter time. Now, the one thing, and it's always a, a, an interesting issue, um, is that everybody says, well, but in the summertime, you're heating up that air. And that's true. Uh, and, and we want that. We are taking that kitchen exhaust air and we are uh, increasing the temperature uh, of that outdoor air uh, as, it, as it approaches, as it, it is in contact with, uh, with that kitchen, with that kitchen exhaust surface. And what we've done, uh, and, and we want that because what we do in our system, in our makeup air system, is we take that heat, advance the slide, I think. Sorry, maybe not. We take that heat uh, and we cool it off uh, with our makeup air unit. So we ran that heat across a cooling coil. We absorb the heat out of the uh, airstream and we reject that heat back into our domestic hot water system through our heat pump. So the air absorbed in the the air handling unit uh, makeup airstream provides uh, the, the, it, it provides this increased cooling load that we take that heat out and it's re rejected back into our heat, uh, our hot water system. So the warmer that air comes into our air handling unit, the more energy we actually manage to recover and reject into our hot water system. So that got us to thinking: what other opportunities are there for us to recover heat? So if you remember those bubbles that Melissa was talking about before, the single biggest load, uh, energy load in our building is the domestic hot water system. And that got us to thinking as well. Um, and this was another thing that we sort of deviated from our illustrative design is what we did was uh, rather than put in those uh, heat recovery coils that sort of encircle the, the, the drain lines, um, which were quite expensive. What we did was we collected the shower waste streams only because it's relatively clean water and it's relatively warm water. We collected that in a separate sump pit in the basement. 
Uh, and then we pump that same warm water through a set of heat exchangers and that same heat pump system we use to uh, run that chill water circuit through the other side of the heat exchanger and again absorb the heat out of that wastewater stream and reject it through the heat pump back into our domestic hot water system. So in the winter, we still do need uh, to temper our um, temper the outdoor air systems serving the uh, serving the kitchen. And so rather than again getting a gas fired system to to you know uh, heat up the air, what we did was we said, well wait a minute, we have all this domestic hot water. Why don't we look at a way to use either the, the same drain water through another set of heat exchangers to uh, warm up that air, to temper that air again? Or alternatively, on days when we've depleted that, that cistern, we can actually go back into the domestic hot water tank and use it uh, as a source of, of heating of hot water for our, uh, for our air handling unit makeup. So this is the only time I've ever done it, but it's certainly something I'll be looking at uh, in future is utilizing our domestic hot water storage. This is a fairly big battery uh, volume of water that we, uh, we're utilizing as, uh, as a heat source for, for the makeup air system. So what does all this mean? Um, we, in our energy model, uh, we've managed to demonstrate um, that COP for just that heat pump alone has got, we've got a figure of 4.3. But when we start including all that free waste heat, that COP climbs up to 5.2, which is where we start um, flirting with uh, compliance with uh, passive house certification. Um, and the domestic hot water uh, load uh, that's covered by that heat recovery uh, heat pump We've taken 43% of that uh, waste heat uh, and attributed or, or converted it back into domestic hot, into our domestic hot water load. Um, and the rest, the remainder is made up by, um, by an electric uh, immersion heater. So there's more. And this is where we really sort of tipped um, the scales in all of this. And when we started looking at this, we started looking at all of our wastes uh, all of our waste streams. We looked at our drains. We looked at um, the kitchen. You know, the the exhaust going out the window. The one other thing that we we looked at was the laundry, because a conventional uh, laundry we would have had uh, electric dryers, then uh, uh, tremendous amount of makeup air that also had to be tempered, uh, and our coil loads in the energy model were just suffering as a result of that. So what we said was, well, wait a minute. Suppose we take a look at these ventless uh, commercial dryers, uh, these heat pump dryers, and we reject that dryer heat back into the space. And we put uh, fan cool units in the laundry room, again, with a cooling coil connected to uh, that heat pump unit. And that heat pump unit now also picks up, uh, in addition to the domestic, uh, the, the, sorry, the kitchen, uh, the kitchen makeup air, uh, the gray water system that uh, we collected from the showers, but we also pick up the heat from the laundry, um, uh, the laundry system. And all of that uh, is now plugged back into our domestic hot water load. There is some really interesting issues about that dryer. There are, well, there is only one brand available in North America uh, and for commercial, uh, for a commercial ventless uh, heat pump dryer. There are several available in Europe. None of them meet the North American uh, standards for uh, electrical standards for the wiring, uh, uh, the wiring harnesses that are associated with that. Uh, in speaking with some of those laundry uh, um, uh, equipment manufacturers, they, they claim to be looking at this, um, although none of them have really sort of moved off of this. I'd like to think with a lot of like prodding and pushing that there will be more than one option available in the future. Hopefully uh, give, uh, uh, you, know, you know, get out some competition with these guys. Just one issue that you guys should all be aware of. Um, some other design considerations. What happens in the summertime when we have a big cooling load 
but we don't have a very big hot water load because the students are gone for the summer. So, and we're generating too much heat uh, out of that heat pump that uh, the domestic hot water system can't, um, can't recover. Uh, that's certainly something that needed to be thought out. Uh, and what we ended up doing was actually having to reject uh, some of that heat through a fairly large uh, air, uh, 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 cooling coil. So we actually had to circulate the domestic hot water through a coil and that rejects heat back out into, into, uh, uh, into, the, uh, into the airstream. Uh, when we when we have too much when there is no domestic hot water load in the building. Um, the other thing was we couldn't do the entire domestic hot water, we couldn't cover the entire domestic hot water load for the building with that heat pump. So there is uh, some uh, backup uh, electric uh, immersion heaters in in the uh, in the storage system, in the storage tanks. Um, and the one question that we know. Uh, we're expecting is this idea of this uh, direct uh, drain water heat recovery system uh, where we have those copper coils that, that roll around um, the drain pipe versus our uh, solution for the heat pump. Now I'll go back to uh, what I'd said earlier about this being a design build competition um, and sort of looking for the best heat recovery with the least cost. And we sort of picked up this off the Home Depot site today which is a four inch drain uh, heat recovery for um, uh, unit for, uh, for that, that shower. Uh, we have over 300 suites in here and this was gonna uh, add a cost uh, of over, once it's installed of over $300,000, I believe. And there were other issues that, that complicated the use of this equipment um, in, in our neck of the woods, uh, we follow the Ontario Building Code, uh, and the, the plumbing co the plumbing code portion of that, we are obligated to have a shutoff valve for individual suites inside the suite. This heat recovery uh, device actually has to be located in the vertical drain line below that suite, which actually started to increase the amount of piping uh, that we would have had to have done for each and every suite, and uh, through some uh, working with our trade contractors, realized we realized that it was actually going to be less expensive running an independent gray water drain from the showers uh, to a cistern than it would be to have put all of these units in. Now, I'm not going to say that this is a better heat recovery. What I'm saying is that there was a less expensive option that got us past the, uh, the, uh, the certification, the, the passive house certification. And with that, what I'm gonna do is turn it back over to Melissa. Thank you, Dave. So thank you, Dave, very much. And uh, we hope you've appreciated the presentation so far. So we just wanna sum up some of the things we've talked about today. So one thing we wanted to talk about was back to that future-proofing concept. So what are some best, best practices that you can take away from this case study that we've done? Um, one thing to consider is, use every single source of waste heat. Look at your building, you know, every building is a little bit different, every typology is different, but consider every single source of waste heat in your building and think of, you know, out of the box ideas for how you can tie those all together. Uh, from a domestic hot water perspective, you know, again, use that waste heat, but also use electrification to sort of maximize your benefits there. And on a general sense, what are some key lessons that you can take away? Well, the main one is really question the status quo. So like Dave said, uh, we didn't necessarily follow everything that University of Toronto asked for at the beginning, but we gave them a design that worked, that meant passive house certification uh, and was a little bit out of the box. So question that status quo and see what you can do to, you know, achieve passive house certification and, and really find some synergies. Uh, point number three, between your waste heat rejection and demand. Uh, and also something extremely important is that you need deeply integrated design between your teams. So this would not have worked if we MCW worked alone in this. Uh, we worked really closely with our passive house certification team at RDH uh, and with everybody else to make sure that, you know, the contractors, every single person on this team to make sure that, you know, we can move forward with these designs and that any 
snafus that came up along the way were smoothed out as fast as possible. So we wanted to thank you for listening to our presentation today. Again, my name is Melissa Light. This is David McCarricker, uh, and we look forward to your questions.